Good day, everyone. Welcome to another lecture for biostatistics. This is Noreen Marie Foliosco. So the following discussion will be on the normal distribution, a particular pattern of distribution of numbers around the mean. This type of distribution is important not only because it demonstrates a natural variation that often occurs, but because it can provide a kind of statistical skeleton key for data analysis and testing hypotheses. The outline for the current lecture will be as follows. So the first portion will be an introduction where we will have a quick recall about frequency distributions, which we've already touched on in previous discussions, um, a definition of random variables, um, and then we would move on to probability distributions. After which, we will discuss the normal distribution, which is a type of continuous probability distribution. Okay, so just to recall, um, let us first talk about key points about distributions, which we've already touched on in earlier lectures. So distributions or frequency distributions are the frequency of occurrences of different numbers or events in a population. Consider, for example, the following data on pigmentation in a certain fish species. The amount of pigmentation is represented by five classes, where zero corresponds to no black pigmentation, and four refers to solid black pigmentation. So under each class are the number of fish with the corresponding type or degree of pigmentation. So here it is represented in a bar graph. You may remember in the lecture on data presentation, frequency distributions are represented in columns or bars. In the upper left, you will see the frequency of individuals with certain numbers of teeth. On the upper right, you will see a frequency of certain ages uh, from 15 to 19 years. The graph below, with clustered blue and light blue bars, shows the number of individuals whose cold symptoms have persisted under two treatment regimes. The blue bar shows a group treated with a cold drug, while the light blue bar represents a group treated with a placebo. The x-axis shows the number of days cold symptoms have persisted. You will see that the blue bar is distributed slightly to the left, which implies that the cold drug may be having an effect on alleviating flu symptoms. On the other hand, the light blue bar is distributed to the right, which tells us that the subjects treated with the placebo continue to present cold symptoms for more days. Okay, so a probability distribution is a function that gives all possible outcomes of values that a random variable may take on. For the concept of a random variable, let us consider the coin toss. When we toss a coin, we end up with either heads or tails. If we let x be the number of heads, this means x can only either be 0 or 1. When a coin toss results in tails, the value of x is 0. If it is heads, x is 1. Now, let's consider an example on the number of female children in a family. In a two-child family, the possible combinations of the sexes of children are boy-boy, two males, boy-girl, girl-boy, and girl-girl, or two females. If we let x be the number of girls, the possible values are 0, 1, or 2. If the combination is BB or boy boy, the value of X is 0. If the combination is boy girl or girl boy, the value of X is 1. Finally, if the combination is girl girl, the value of X is 2. So in either case, X is a random variable because its values are based on a random outcome. Each point in the sample in the sample space corresponds to only one numerical value. A random variable simply assigns a numerical value to the outcome of a random process. If 
you remember, there are two types of variables, discrete and continuous. A discrete random variable can assume a countable number of possible values. So there is a clear break in the outcomes. An example would be the number of days it rained in the month of February. The values of x may be 0, 1, 2, and so on until 28 for the total number of calendar days in February in a non-leap year. On the other hand, a continuous random variable can assume any value in an interval on the real number line. Going back to that rainfall example, a relevant continuous random variable is the amount of rainfall in February. The possible values of x would be 0 to infinity, or if using this rainfall gauge, 0 to 30 millimeters. You might get a rainfall measurement of 6.231 millimeters or 7.305 millimeters, whereas you would have whole countable integers for the number of days it rained. Now that we've reviewed distributions and random variables, we can now move on to probability distributions. A probability distribution is a function that describes all possible values and likelihoods that a random variable can take within a given range. When annotated, it is written as P and parenthesis X and P parenthesis X is equal to X. So we'll better understand what these definitions mean as we go through the examples. Note that the following examples are for discrete random variables. Okay, If we look more closely at the example on female children in a two-child family, uh, this is how it's broken down. So the first child can either be a boy or a girl. And for either possibility, the second child can also be a boy or a girl. Hence, there are four possible outcomes. If we let x be the number of girls, where the values of x can be 0, 1, or 2. The probability of x being equal to 0, or the probability that we end up with a combination of two boys, is 1 out of 4. Numerically, that equals 0 0.25. On the other hand, the probability of x being equal to 1 is the case for two outcomes. Uh, either outcome, boy-girl or girl-boy, is 1 out of 4 possibilities. We then add these probabilities and get 0 0.5. Finally, the probability of x being equal to 2 or an outcome where there are two girls is also 1 out of 4 possibilities which is also equal to 0 0.25. In tabular form, here is the discrete probability distribution for a two-child family. So the expected value for a discrete random variable is given by the total or the sum of the probability of all possible outcomes. So if we were asked how many girls might be expected in a two-child family, we would need to total the probability of all possible outcomes. So where we let x be the number of girls in a two-child family, so that expected value or that expected number would be equal to 0 times 0.25 for the first outcome plus 1 times 0.5 for the two possible outcomes plus 2 times 0.25 for the last outcome, which will all equal 1. So what this means is, in a large enough sample of families with two children, the average number of daughters per family is 1. Okay, now let's look at this example where 1,000 tickets were sold for a cake worth 400 pesos and the winning ticket number is drawn randomly. 
So the question here is, what is the expected value of the raffle? So the probability of winning the cake is 1 in 1,000. Thus, the expected value of the raffle is given by the expected value of the ticket is equal to 400, so that's your, that's your outcome, times the probability, which is 1 in 1,000. So that will be equal to 0.4. So what this means is, if you bought many tickets, the return on each ticket would only be 40 centavos. So it would then be unwise to pay more than 40 centavos per ticket, unless of course the proceeds are for a good cause. In this example, a game is set up such that you have a 1 in 5 chance of winning 350 pesos, or the probability there would be uh, 0.2 and a 4 in 5 chance of losing 50 pesos. Uh, the probability there would be 0.8. So what is your expected gain? Where we let x be the amount of gain, so that would be given by 350 times the probability of gaining it at 0.2 plus minus 50, because that's a loss, times the probability of that occurring, which is 0.8. So that will all equal 30 pesos. So this means if you play the game a large number of times, your winnings will average 30 pesos per game. In this third example, you are presented with two investment portfolios showing potential profits and probabilities. Now, which of the two portfolios is the better choice and how much would you stand to gain from your choice? So on the left, you will see portfolio A, um, which shows the profits that you would gain, so these are your outcomes, and the probabilities of these particular outcomes. So the first is you have minus 1,500, so that means you would stand to lose 1,500 pesos and a probability of 0.2. In the next column, you'll see that you, you would stand to lose minus 100 for a probability of 0.1. In the following columns, you would see gains. So these are all positive numbers, a gain of 500 for a probability of 0.4, 1,500 uh, for a probability of 0.2, and a gain of 3,500 for a probability of 0.1. So similarly, uh, on the right-hand side, you will see the column showing the profits or the potential outcomes for portfolio B and their corresponding probabilities or the chances that this will happen. So for the first row, you will see that you would stand to lose um, as much as 2,500 pesos and the probability of that happening is 0.2, 20% chance of happening. Uh, in the next row, you will see that you would stand to lose uh, 500 pesos and the probability of that is 0.1. And then the last three columns also show gains, where you would have a gain of 1,500 um, for a likelihood of 0.3, 2,500 for a likelihood of also 0.3, and a gain of 3,500 um, for a likelihood of 0.1. So let A be the profit for portfolio A and B, be the profit for portfolio B. So for portfolio A, our expected value is equal to uh, the total or the sum of each outcome and their respective probability. So that is um, negative 1,500 times 0 0.2 plus negative 100 times 0 0.1 plus 500 times 0 0.4 plus 1,500 times 0 0.2 plus 3,500 times 0.1. So that will equal 540 pesos. Now, if we look on the other hand for portfolio B, um, we would go through the same process where you have each outcome and their respective probability um, multiplied, then totaled for each of those rows. So you have uh, negative 2,500 times 0.2, plus negative 500 times 0.1, plus 1,500 times 0.3, plus 2,500 times 0.3, plus 3,500 times 0.1. So 
So that will all total 1,000 pesos. So you'll see in this case that portfolio B, the estimated value for portfolio B is greater than the estimated value for portfolio A. So this means that repeated investments in portfolio B will on average gain 460 pesos or uh, 1,000 pesos minus 540 pesos over portfolio A. Okay, so uh, that is it for examples of our uh, discrete probability distributions. So now we move on to the normal distribution, which is a type of continuous probability distribution. The normal distribution is a type of continuous probability distribution where the values of a random variable cluster around the mean. On a graph or histogram, normal distribution is characterized by a bell shape. Hence, a normal curve is also referred to as a bell curve. Normal distribution is also known as Gaussian distribution, uh, named for the German mathematician Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss. Normal distribution is an important probability distribution because it is applicable to many real-world examples. A few of these include height, weight at birth, test scores, measurements made by machines in manufacturing and industry, and for those of us studying biology, certain species measurements. The bell or normal curve is recognized by a few key features. First, it is unimodal. That is, it has a single peak. The peak is also the position of the mean. In the case of normal distribution, the mean is also the median and the mode. Normal distribution is symmetrical. So the curve on the left is a mirror image of the curve on the right. This is why we express the standard deviation as plus minus the standard deviation. So the frequency of individual numbers falls off equally away from the mean in both directions. The mirror S-shaped curves on either side of the mean give points of inflection where convex around the mean changes to convex towards the extremes. Finally, the normal curve tapers at either end into two tails. Normal distribution is characterized by the mean and standard deviation. The mean determines the position of the distribution. In the figure, you will see two curves with different means. If you will notice, their corresponding positions on an axis are also different. Thus, it follows that when a set of normally distributed data is adjusted, resulting in a shift of the mean, the rest of the values will follow, given their tendency to group around the center. On the other hand, the standard deviation signifies how spread out the data is. In the new figure, you will see two curves with two different standard deviations. The flat curve is twice the standard deviation of the tall curve. You will see later that any lateral change in the curve will be compen compensated for by its height. However we distort the distribution, vertically or horizontally, as long as we keep it symmetrical, the three areas remain in their original proportions and the equal spacing of the standard deviation scale on the horizontal axis is retained. Interest in the normal curve is because of the information it can provide in relation to probabilities or proportions for a given random variable for a population, or a sample. If we look at the normal curve in terms of standard units on x and probability densities on y, it is then possible to define the area under the curve. It is most important to remember that the total area under the curve is equal to 1 or 100%. The area within one standard deviation away from the mean, on the left and on the right, is equal to 0.68 or 68%. 
This simply means that 68% of observations will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. The area within two standard deviations away from the mean is 0.95 or 95%, or 95% of the observations fall within two standard deviations of the mean. The area within three standard deviations away from the mean is 0.997 or 99.7%. Like the previous definitions, this only means that 99.7% of the observations fall within three standard deviations of the mean. Collectively, this is known as the empirical rule, or more literally, the 68-95-99.7 rule. It is possible for observations to fall more than three standard deviations away from the mean. It should be noted that even as the curve moves further from the mean, it never reaches zero or visually, the line never touches the x-axis. At this point, the probabilities are very small. Outside the four standard deviations of the mean, the probability is somewhere like 6 over 100,000. Now let's see those definitions, those concepts, um, in an example. So let's take a virtual field trip to a chicken farm. So let's say that we collect a sample of 100 chicken eggs laid on the same day. Uh, the mean for the weights of those chicken eggs is 65.1 grams. So you'll see in our tabulated data, the column on the left showing the different weights in grams, and the column on the right showing the number of eggs uh, corresponding to uh, each of those weight classes. So the total for our sample is 100. So when we visualize that, this is what it looks like in a histogram. And you will see that it is apparently normally distributed. So on the x-axis, you will have the different weights in grams. And then on the y, uh, this indicates the frequency or the number of eggs per weight class. Okay, so in our earlier definitions, we were talking about areas under the normal curve on either side of the mean. So if you were to look at just the right side of the mean, uh, you'd see that half of 68% is 34%. And then in the area just after plus one standard deviations from the mean, you have 13.5%. And then the area which is after or beyond plus two standard deviations of the mean is 2.5%. And then you'll see the black arrows showing the points of inflection. All right, so going back to our example, where we have a sample of 100 chicken eggs, um, which were laid and then collected on the same day, we get a sample mean of 65.1 grams and a corresponding standard deviation of 1.6. So this is our histogram. The prediction here is that 68% of the eggs laid on the same day that the samples were taken weigh between 63.5 and 66.7 grams. So you'll see that we, uh, we came up with this range because of our mean and our standard deviation. Now, what is the weight range of 95% of the eggs? Okay, so we know that the area under the normal curve uh, that covers 95% of your observations is plus minus two standard deviations away from the mean. So this means that 95% of the eggs laid on the same day that the samples were taken weighed between 61.9 and 68.3 grams. Okay, so the standard deviation gives us an estimate of the relative frequency of a number occurring in a sample. So, for example, a 64-gram egg from our sample of 100 eggs can occur 34% of the time. 
a smaller egg, 62.5 gram egg, um, can be expected to occur 13.5% of the time. But a particularly small egg, or 59 gram egg, would occur only 2.5% of the time. So the more standard deviation worse, uh, the observation is away from the mean, the rarer is its frequency in the population of possible numbers available for sampling. So when your observation is within uh, one standard deviation of the mean, uh, that means that it occurs quite frequently. So there's a greater chance of it occurring. If it's beyond two standard deviations from the mean, um, it rarely occurs, or the chance of it occurring in the population or in your sample would be exceptionally large or small. Okay, so the relative frequencies are actually our probabilities. So a 34% chance of picking a sample that is within plus one standard deviation from the mean, or just to the right of your mean, is given by P equal to 0.34, where P is your probability. So when P is equal to 1, this means that you have a 100% certainty of this value occurring. Now, a 68% chance of picking a sample that is within one standard deviation from the mean, so we're now considering uh, both the left and the right side of the mean, is given by P equal to 0.68. A 2.5% chance of picking a sample beyond plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean is given by P, which is equal to 0 0.05. So this means that we have a 1 in 20 chance of um, picking this value or of this value occurring in the sample. Now, if we apply that information to our example with our sample of 100 chicken eggs, the language there would be uh, the probability that the eggs laid on the same day weigh between 63.5 and 66.7 grams is 0.68. Okay, so that's it for our example and our initial discussion on the normal distribution. Stay tuned for part 2 for a discussion on the relevance of the normal distribution on biological data. So thank you for listening.